Hello, Knights enthusiasts and or innocent bystanders who can't look away. We've made it. Baywatch Nights is rocky and at times insufferable, but this episode is truly a highlight. At last, Mitch is gonna face off with the vampire. We have creatures of the week now. We've got the blob, we've got the vampire. You might have noticed that, in the fashion of The X-Files, a lot of the stuff they've faced on the show has been murky and ill-defined, some weird thing you've never heard of, or something you've definitely heard of but given a stupid name. Not so here. It's the vampire. Lifeguard slash PI Mitch Buchanan faces the vampire. A tale as old as time. The vampire is played by Felicity Waterman, who the Baywatch team previously worked with on the pilot to Thunder in Paradise. She was set up to be a main character, then unceremoniously killed off screen when it went to series so Hulk Hogan could steal her daughter or something. Whatever the reason was she didn't end up in the series, they were on good enough terms to hire her again to play the vampire. And oh, what a performance. Vampirka Fuster! <laughs> There's a lot of slinking around a pseudo-enigma music in the opening here, but in summary, the vampire pours herself some champagne, rubs the glass against her boobs before taking it outside to another bottle of champagne so she can pour a tiny bit more champagne into the glass. <laughs> also, Ryan and Griff are jogging nearby. So apparently dumpy, schlubby Ryan has enlisted Griff's help in becoming buff, so they're taking a casual late-night fog jog. I'm making record time on this fog walk better pick up the pace. Yes, this is where we're at with trying to include Griff at this point. But they aren't the only weirdos doing this oddly specific activity. You ready? Come on. Yes, they did just add jump scare music to a jogger. Pretty spooky, huh, folks? No, not the vampire! Ryan and Griff happen upon the jogger's body, to which they react extremely mildly. Going into the daytime, which makes me wonder just how late they were out doing this jog, uh, the homicide detective they speak to, another rando we've just met named Chorus, says a witness description of the killer matches a woman in the hotel across the street. So he asks Ryan to come along and see if she looks familiar. I don't know why they didn't ask the witness who said they saw the woman and instead asked Ryan who stated she didn't see anyone, but who am I to tell Detective Chorus how to do his job? Griff excuses himself from the episode. <sighs> I'm Griff. Oh yeah, she seems normal. Next suspect. Hey, is it procedure to bring a potential murder witness to meet the murder suspect face to face when there hasn't even been any charges and with no protection whatsoever? Sunlight's too much for me to bear. It um, pains my eyes. <sighs> Look, if this chick has been a vampire any longer than like a day, I'm sorry, I don't believe she's lived this long. Do you have some sort of identification? Absolutely. Just a formality. Something that's very important to deal with in life. I'm sorry, what? While Chorus very loudly lists off the vampire's full name and license number to run a background check, Ryan covertly writes it down to do her own investigation. Basically, every single person in the room sucks at the thing they're supposed to be doing. By the way, uh, you have an explanation for the blood found on a nightgown of yours in the bathroom. What? That's something he's throwing out in an O, oh, by the way? Why wasn't that the first thing he asked? Who is this man? Really, though, the audacity of this bitch. Not only does she put absolutely zero effort into hiding that she murdered this guy or that she's the vampire, but she asked Detective Chorus to put her cloak on for her while they head out to the station. And he does it! Would have tried to not stand in front of the mirror, but okay. <laughs> the first thing Ryan does is call Numi. She knows what's up. Numi, thank God. Unfortunately, Numi's not available because this was just filmed to fill in time. So she's got to settle for stupid Mitch. <laughs> All right, Ryan, you got five minutes to tell me about whatever bullshit's going on this week, and then I'm going into vacation mode. How is that different than normal? You know, you make a fair point. You should be a detective. Mitch is already aware of the murder the night before and is pretty uninterested as usual. Ryan is beginning to suspect this woman is the vampire, but even for her, this seems far-fetched. I don't know why, but apparently this is sillier than usual. And if it's far-fetched for Ryan, she's got to throw out a damn good Mitch pitch for him to be pulled into it. There was a reflection of him in the mirror, nothing of her. Mitch, she wears gloves. 
Yeah, sorry, real quick, I'm just checking when my contract expires. I think she's a vampire. <laughs> okay, that's genuinely an amazing reaction. Masterful comedic timing. I have no critiques. At this point, we're all Mitch. But Ryan isn't gonna give up. In order to prove that this woman is the vampire, she pulls out a bunch of books she picked up with info about the vampires. Mitch's condescension is 100% justified in the situation. One of these is a pop-up children's book, for God's sake. And then Ryan's pulling out facts like the vampires wear gloves because they grow hair on their palms. I think having no reflection is probably a clearer sign of the supernatural than wearing gloves, but uh, maybe the pop-up book has something about that. Ryan also points out that this lady has no permanent home, no birth certificate, and first got a credit card in 1951. I kind of feel like if this is information that is able to be pulled up by any ding-dong asking for a background check, maybe the vampire shouldn't have easily given it to the police. They might not think she's the vampire, but they'd probably suspect she stole someone's identity and not really help her out in the murder investigation. And this is admittedly kind of nitpicky, but women couldn't get credit cards without a co-signer until 1974, which Ryan waves away by saying the vampire used a large cash deposit to get around it. Which seems like a weird thing to have on record for someone who appears to be illegally in this country and is, you know, the vampire. Perhaps Mitch will reluctantly consider the idea that this woman is the vampire. Here is his response. So what do you want to do about it? <laughs> Not his fucking problem. Ryan flirts with the idea of calling the police, forgetting that all of this started because she was accompanying the police on an investigation of this woman. So instead, she and Mitch are going to talk to the vampire themselves. <sighs> Whatever. Maybe if the credits run long enough, we can reach the end of the episode. But first, they run to Mitch's place so he can take a shower, despite the fact he's magically become clean on the drive home. And this is gonna take some time. After all, he is a mountain of a man. In fact, this shower is so lengthy that Ryan has time to find blood on her sweatshirt, do some Googling on her computer, call a friend at the coroner's office, call Teague and ask him to bring over some forensics equipment, set up said equipment, and then run some tests on the blood. At this point, I kind of feel like Mitch snuck out his bathroom window and made a run for it. Teague, what are you doing here? You don't usually show up until after I'm done with my 13 hour showers. 13. Hmm. The unlucky number. Take a look at this. It's blood. Healthy and arterial. Right. In its first stages of coagulation. Obviously, blood hits the air and coagulates. Look at the next line. No coagulation, which means it has to be fresh. And that blood is 12 hours old. It's impossible. The blood coagulates. Shut up. Just, just shut up. All of this was an extremely, extremely long-winded way for them to basically say the blood from the murder victim hasn't coagulated yet because of some vampire anti-coagulation enzyme or whatever. Look, you didn't need a microscope to look at some blood and realize it wasn't coagulated. That is something that is evident on a non-microscopic level. And Ryan already saw the woman has no reflection and believes she's a vampire. This is non-relevant information at this point. I do, however, believe that from now on, every show's boring info dump should be broken up by a disinterested middle-aged man making a protein drink in the background. How long had the murder victim been dead? Couple minutes. <gasps> you hear that? Mitch and I are gonna go talk to her in a little while. Do you wanna come with us? No. I thought this type of stuff really intrigues you. Oh, it does. Quite a lot. Hmm, yes, what could this mean? Is Teague doing his own investigation into the vampire woman? Is he hiding secrety secrets from them that will later come into play? Does he possess the forbidden knowledge of the vampire? The answer is a resounding, eh. He has exited the episode, never to return. What the fuck? Just when you think things can't get more baffling, Mitch and Ryan head over to the police station and find it closed off. The building is being condemned, they have no power. In fact, they're in the process of cementing the entrances, but for some fucking reason, they are still conducting business inside. But at least this guy got his handgun folder out in time. <laughs> Ryan has to make a quick pit stop inside, and who should show up but the vampire? <sighs> Oh, jeez, I never realized how creepy that was until someone did it to me. Man, I got issues. I am uh, just waiting for someone in the women's restroom. Are you always so protective? 
have we really given Mitch credit for the bare minimum of waiting outside while someone uses the restroom? Is this considered protective? Fascinating. And most attractive. Eh, uh, whatever floats your boat, lady. <sighs> yeah, I don't know why more shows don't include scenes where characters make post-poop noises just as a vampire mystically fades out of the hallway. Anyway, uh, Mitch tells Ryan nothing about this, despite the fact that these two specifically came here to talk to a woman matching this exact description. Further inside the station, we are introduced to two comic relief prostitutes and their pimp. Uh, pantalone? <laughs> anyway, I don't know, they'll come back into play later. Hey, lifeguard, how's the water? Because we're drowning in here. Wait, how does this guy know Mitch is a lifeguard? This is literally the first time these two have met. Ryan asks if they can speak to the vampire lady and can't come up with any lie whatsoever as to why they want to talk to her. Detective Chorus likes that and says to go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Pretty spooky, huh, folks? All right, where's your client? Ugh, this disgusts me as someone who does need a lot of red meat. Eh, why should they have a consistent establishing shot at the front of the building? It's not like it's a plot point that they're cemented in or anything. The phone's dead. We can get calls coming in but not going out. What? It's a magic phone that can take calls but not make them? This is nonsense. And the fact that they can receive calls doesn't even come into play. They could have just said the lines are dead. Well, folks, we're gonna be wandering around some hallways again. While Detective Chorus kills some time searching for his suspect, Mitch finally puts together that the lady he met in opera gloves that seemed kinda of vampiric might be the vampiric woman in opera gloves Ryan was describing to him. What'd she look like? Uh, she's my height, my weight. My height, my weight, irresistibly attracted to men who wait politely outside of bathrooms, typical vampire stuff. Oh no, I thought I was the main character! <laughs> you poor dumb bastard, didn't you see me? Hey! Rude! <laughs> eh, this is scary, but it's no dumpster chase, that's for sure. Incredible how Mitch is able to transform into a stunt double and suddenly he's even more monkey-like than usual. <laughs> Somehow, doing this gets him away from the vampire for a little bit for... reasons? Wait outside of the loo for me, like one of your French girls. You are fascinating. Each time you just continue to impress me, to amaze me. You come so quickly, so unafraid, and for such a hopeless cause. <laughs> Look, love makes you blind, but what show is this lady watching? Because once he saw her, he was nothing but afraid as she followed his pee trail to where he fell down the stairs. Which, I mean, I wouldn't find that impressive, personally. What do you want? That is a question I have been asking for the last 400 years. For the first time, I think I may have the answer. Yes, after 400 years of wandering the earth alone, it wasn't until this lady saw humble, sweet, jean shirt bedecked detective slash lifeguard Mitch Von Malibu waiting politely outside a bathroom for his friend that she realized what love truly was. We still have 13 minutes left to fill. See you later. 13. Hmm, the unlucky no Ryan, a lady officer, Pantalone, and his prostitutes have been looking for the side door this whole time. And honestly, I have no idea what the layout is because they've been all over the place. Also, I mean, I feel like you could probably break out of some of the entrances anyway. I mean, they were just cementing it now, so it's probably not even dry. So I feel like they, they could have gotten out. <laughs> Even the lady officer points out that she doesn't know where anything is and she works here, so uh, this is needlessly confusing. Ryan says they should stick together, but the prostitutes have other plans. If you want to stay here and like swap spit with a vampire, that's your turn on. Cause we are out of here. This way, Jose. VIPs of the episode! Now, where the hell is this in the police station? The warehouse section? Once we get to that elevator, we home free. Pretty spooky, huh, folks? <laughs> get me instead that bitch with the overbite she did it right in front of me uh, this might seem like an obvious suggestion but can we replace griff with this chick well the vampire left prostitute girl with a message either mitch von malibu gives over his body and soul to her or everyone dies hmm 
It's a tempting offer, but I'm still not over my exploding frog hybrid girlfriend, so... We die? Right around this point, it's understandable that you may have forgotten that this is a spin-off of a lifeguard show. Well, not to worry, because they've incorporated water into the plot, so you know it's in the same universe. It's water. Why does water have to be a Ah, it's the old vampire water tunnel rat trick. <laughs> uh, for some reason, that means the tunnel isn't usable, I guess. On to plan B. It's time to bring in the big guns, and that's Mitch's irresistible sex appeal. Ladies? I knew from the first moment that you were special. I am uh, just waiting for someone in the women's restroom. That you are one of us. The nights will never be the same. I heard you like bad 90s video effects. Does this turn you on? Honey, you're hotter than a burger patty sizzling on a grill and chillier than Hobie when I lock him outside. Give me some sugar, baby. even wait outside of the bathroom for me. Uh, sure, why not? Gotta say, really didn't expect Pant alone to make it, but Baywatch Nights does nothing if not subvert expectations. Hmm, kind of thought they were setting something up earlier in the episode for Teague to show up and save us. Hmm, oh well. I guess I'd better act really bothered by the light while I'm all alone so I can prank Ryan into thinking I'm turning into a vampire. I want to suck your blood. <laughs> Four people died. Next time on Baywatch, Mitch is, uh, hunting a vampire again. Also, it's a crappy backdoor pilot about firefighters and lifeguards. Let's get fired up.